I'm Stephen Wooten. I'm the director of the Food Studies Program. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Global Studies. And uh, today's panel is a panel of recipients of the Food Studies Graduate Research Award. And uh, over the years, we've been able to, in the program, garner support from the graduate school and, and through the Food Studies Program itself to do, do these annual uh, research awards for folks in any aspect of food studies. And I've really enjoyed being part of that process of seeing who comes forward and what kinds of things they're working on from very kind of lab focused research that I've seen come through the grant program to, to work in, in uh, really kind of literary humanism and, and everything in between there, which is just fabulous. And to know that we have so many graduate students. One thing that, that folks might not have known who are around, you know, or have recently arrived or what, whatnot, but the food studies program, actually one of the key building blocks from uh, the early days was graduate student research. When, when we had the big food justice conference that was sponsored by the Wayne Morris Center years ago, I guess nine years ago, maybe 10 years ago or something like that, a long time ago. Uh, one of the things that we did, and I was put in charge of because I was director of grad studies in, in international studies at the time, was to do a grad forum. And, and I reached out and found people that were working on all kinds of stuff that didn't know each other at all, didn't have any academic kind of connection to each other. And we got to have this really great poster session with Vandana Shiva as the commentator. It was unbelievable. So like for me, the, food, the grad studies piece was always really, really important. And it has been really important now that we have the grad specialization and we have all these grants. I have a list that I was just looking at the other day of all the recipients of this award. And there are a great number of them is over, I would say 16 or 18 or something in the last few years. And they're very diverse, which is great. And I sent that list to uh, the, the graduate school when I was asking them for the renewed funding. And they were super impressed by, by the work that people are doing. So it's a long introduction to say that the grad panel has a special, a special place in, in my heart to see the kind of work that people are doing and to know that the, that the scholarship that, that you graduate students represented here and, and all across the board are doing is critically important to kind of the mission of the university and to see that food studies is a plank of that is really cool. Brings visibility to our food studies program and food studies hopefully br brings a little bit more visibility to your work too, to different people that might not see it necessarily, get a chance to kind of tune into it and see what's happening. That's a long, a long introduction to the panel. And uh, this is the last presentation of the, of the school year. And uh, you know, along the way, I've been thanking Lisa for all of her support. Lisa Fink, who's been the program assistant for food studies this year. And she's done a tremendous job of putting it together. And none of the stuff that I do in my role as director would be possible without her support. I'm really grateful, Lisa, to you for everything you've done this year for food studies. And, uh, and you've set us up well for, for next year already too. So thanks very much. Uh, let's see here. So today's panel, let me introduce the panelists and they're gonna tell you about their work. So I'm not gonna do that so they can have more time to do it themselves. Uh, Anna Khan from Prevention Sciences. I was on her committee and we had, was it last week we had your defense for your PhD? Dr. Khan, right? Yeah, she's gonna tell you about her work. She did a great job with that with that uh, process. I'm really glad, and, and you'll be hearing about her work on COVID and, and uh, student food security. And uh, Yasmin Diaz Mendias is here with us from Romance Languages, and and I understand she's working toward finishing up her project as well, which she's going to tell us about today. I'm glad to see her, to meet her here. Unfortunately, with COVID and stuff, haven't had a chance to meet in person, but I'm really glad that you're part of this community and going to be presenting today. Well, thank you. And Ellen, I know Ellen Zeissen Hene well. She's uh, one of my students in the Global Studies program. She's been a, a great part of our program and the Food Studies program as well. And she'll be telling you about uh, her work and her connections to Guinea and her works uh, on kind of food insecurity and culture from a distance. You know, COVID has impacted all of the, uh, of the students that are on the panel, I'm sure, in different ways, informed their research in some cases. So, uh, 
Anna, Yasmin, and, and Alan, welcome, welcome to this panel. And uh, I'll turn turn this process over to Lisa and the panelists for for the rest of uh, of the presentation. Lisa, should, should I go? Or yep, I think we're going in alphabetical order. Oh, okay, okay. Whenever Thank you. you're ready, Anna, go ahead and share your screen. Okay, awesome. Sounds good. Hi, everyone. My name is Anna, and I am going to just pull up my presentation so that we can get going. Um, it's so exciting to see some familiar faces and some new faces. So um, I'm going to briefly talk about my research. There's a lot more into this, but, you know, we only have seven to ten minutes. So, um yeah, I'm, I'm a soon-to-be doctoral graduate in the prevention science program here at the U of O in the College of Ed. And um, today I'm going to briefly be discussing the research which the U of Food Studies program generously helped fund, um, which was titled The COVID-19 Pandemic and University of Oregon Students Food Security and Eating Behaviors. Okay, so just a very, very brief background. Um, the USDA or the United States Department of Agriculture defines food insecurity as the lack of the ability to consistently purchase ample food to meet nutritional needs. And pre-COVID-19 pandemic, a systematic review from 2017 found that 35 to 42 percent of college students around the world um, experienced food insecurity while they were in college. And studies have also shown that when students move away from home to college, consumption of nutrient-dense foods, including fruits and vegetables, goes down, while energy-dense foods and beverages goes up. And so, really quickly, so, but what about food security and eating behaviors during the pandemic? Um, when I was doing my research, there were only three published studies that had assessed food security of college students during the pandemic, which found that college students at various universities around the United States had a range of 22 to 34 percent of food insecurity during the pandemic. And currently, there are no studies that have assessed eating behaviors of college students during the pandemic. So the overarching objective of the study was to assess University of Oregon students' food security and eating behaviors before and during the COVID-19 pandemic. So what I did to assess this was I created a 57 question Qualtrics survey for this dissertation using validated measures. And it was open for all students who um, to take between late August and early November, 2020. And the time frame of August to November 2020, I'm going to refer to that as fall 2020 throughout this presentation, just to, for brevity's sake. Um, and students were asked to recall both their food security and their eating behaviors pre-COVID-19, specifically in February 2020, and then their experiences during the COVID-19 pandemic at the time that they were taking the survey, which was between six to nine months after the stay at home orders began in the United States. And so students were recruited through messages sent via, so, via email and social media, which also happened between August and November of last year. And the sample that took the survey were University of Oregon students enrolled in classes in fall 2020, which were, and they had to be at least 18 years of age. And if they completed at least 80% of the survey, they were entered to win one of 65 total $20 Safe, Safeway e-gift cards. And there were a total of 779 completed surveys by students. So now I'm going to move move tracks a little bit and talk briefly about the results from this study. So one of the questions I asked was, how have U of O students' food insecurity changed with COVID-19 stay-at-home orders? And so overall, overall, students did not experience a significant change in food insecurity from February 2020 to fall 2020 when controlling for student status, international student status, race and ethnicity, and sexual orientation. And so just kind of an aside, what was found was that 46.8% of students reported being food insecure in February 2020 before the pandemic. And um, 
47.3% of students reported food insecurity in fall 2020, um, which is pretty high. It's about 50%. And this is this number is actually lower than the amount found by Kiara Kashuba in 2017. And she found that 52% of University of Oregon students were food insecure, but we cannot compare these two results from these two studies because the sample of people that took these surveys are completely different. Um, although you can see there was like a slight decrease, but we can't compare them. But there were significant changes in food insecurity by sexual orientation, such that those who identified as part of the LGBTQIA plus community had greater increases in food insecurity from February 2020 to fall 2020, and heterosexual students did not have a significant change. So this is a graph showing the change in food insecurity over time by sexual orientation. So as you can see on the x-axis here, um, the uh, it's time with two time points, February 2020 and fall 2020. And on the y-axis, it's food insecurity. And bigger numbers means more food insecurity. So the solid green line here um, are heterosexual students and the yellow dotted line are members of the LGBTQIA plus community. And as you can see, there was a greater increase, which was significant in food insecurity from February to fall 2020 for the yellow dotted line or the members of LGBTQIA plus. And there was no significant increase in food insecurity for heterosexual students. Okay, so another research question I had was, how have U of O students eating behaviors changed with COVID-19 stay at home orders? So again, overall, there was no significant changes in eating behaviors for any of the food or beverage categories that I assessed when controlling for student status, international student status and race and ethnicity. But although something very interesting was found, um, U of O students, both pre-pandemic and during the pandemic, we're consuming low amounts of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and protein foods. So on average, they were consuming less than two servings per day of each of those categories, both before and during the pandemic, which are below recommended daily amounts to consume. So some conclusions. Firstly, University of Oregon students continue even through even during the pandemic to experience food insecurity at high rates. Although overall their food insecurity and eating behaviors did not significantly change during the COVID-19 pandemic. And students who identified as part of the LGBTQIA plus community had significant increases in food insecurity while heterosexual students did not. Although questions related to why these groups were, were different was not assessed. Previous research shows that people who identify as sexual minorities experience discrimination, including employment and housing, which may increase food insecurity amongst this group. So future research and a deep dive into why this occurs, especially for um, sexual minorities and how to help these individuals gain access to healthy foods is needed. And assessing food insecurity programming, working with students and asking them what they want to see from food security programming and um, the types of foods that they want to see available for purchase on campus is necessary. And a project that I'd really love to conduct in the future, I don't know how feasible this is, um, is a longitudinal study of people in college and following them after college for a couple of years and assessing their food security changes and their eating behavior changes. Um, is food security, is food insecurity just an acute thing that's happening during college or is it more chronic? Are they still being food insecure after they get out of college? Um, I think that uh, this would be a really interesting project. I don't know how feasible it would be though, but I thought that would be something really neat to look at in the future. And lastly, I'd like to thank the UO Food Studies Program for helping support this research. Um, it really helped so much. I think that a lot of more students participated because of the incentives um, that was given through the money through the uh, UO Food Studies Program. So I just wanted to say a big thank you. And these are my references. Awesome. Thank you very much, Anna. That's great. Thank you. 
and and I think we will do it like kind of conference style. So they'll get the next presentations, then come back and do kind of Q and A for the group. Is that okay? All Perfect. right. Yes, I mean, thank you. You're ready, you can share. Yeah. Excellent. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Okay, I hope everybody can see that. And again, just to echo Anna's, um, you know, little disclosure, for the purposes of time, I will only be reading my quotes that are in Italian in Italian so that you all get to hear the sound of the Italian, maybe learn a, one or two words in Italian along the process. But I do have the quotes translated in English. All right. So a literal taste of food industrialization apprehending women's issues of the contadina, contadine and campesines. In a Twitter video titled Revolution with the Working Class, Infinite Expletives and Red Hair, Mona at the hallway raises concerns about the visibility of the working class. She says, reopening America. Anyone who says that says that because they're not seeing those who have kept America open. The invisible, the uninsured, the undocumented, the poor, the working class, unquote. El Tahawi argues that the reopening of America narrative impairs the visibility of the obscured workforces that are foundational to sustaining communities during a global pandemic. The farm worker is often overlooked as a crucial component to the agricultural workforce, and little awareness is given to the ways that the industrialization of food has impacted their livelihoods and professions. The industrialization of agricultural production has occulted the socioeconomic conditions of the very workers that produce our food to the point that most consumers are completely detached to the, to the ways that foods are being produced. In this comparative project, I looked at two distinct farm workers, the contadina, the contadina of the Italian pianura and the campesina farm worker of the United States Southwest to apprehend the socioeconomic effects of industrialization on the farm worker. This essay addresses El Tahawi's call for visibility by close examining the oral narratives of Contadina and Campesinas in Nuto Rebelli's La Nello Forte and the archived oral narratives at the UC San Diego Farm Workers Movement Documentation Project to uncover women's hidden labor in agriculture, the prominence of migration and the socioeconomic conditions living in the margins of poverty. I trace the origins of industrialization through their narratives by connecting their lived experiences to the Miracolo Economico Italiano and the U.S. sponsored Bracero program. And just to contextualize this a little bit, so we have Italy here and the stories that I'm following mostly come from this northern area here, this valley, which is the Po Valley, which is an agriculturally rich um, production. And most of the women are coming either from southern Italy or from around that northern area. And then in the U.S. Southwest, we're looking at oral narratives crossing here in what used to be um, Mexico. This project is centered on women's oral narratives who recount their live stories amidst industrialization of the 20th century. Their testimonies apprehend the issues that this essay seeks to expand on, women's hidden at labor in agriculture, the prominence of migration, and the socioeconomic conditions of the marginalized poor. The term apprehend comes from environmental humanist Rob Nixon, who states, apprehension is a crossover term that draws, the do that draws together the domains of perception, emotion, and action. In his book, Slow Violence and the Environmentalism of the Poor, Nixon elaborates on how unimagined communities use narratives to apprehend slow violence to address the violent yet hidden impacts of industrialization, globalization, and neoliberalism on a personal level. Nixon defines unimagined communities as communities internal to the space of a nation state, communities whose vigorously unimagined condition becomes indispensable to maintaining a highly selective discourse of national development. The testimonies of the Contadina and the Campesina offer insight into the life and work of women farm workers during this period of national development national development, narrating the direct impact of agricultural industrialization. The oral narratives of the contadine and campesinas are the primary sources in this research as they aid to apprehend the issues surrounding women's labor and agriculture. Women's labor and agriculture is, an inter is intersectional as women's bodies are used not only to reproduce but also to contribute to the production of and cultivation of seasonal agriculture. The testimonies of these women across these two working classes describe the intensity around the types of jobs they took, often at very young ages, often having to leave school to help contribute to family, the family unit, forcing girls to mature as they began taking full-time jobs in fields and factories. 
Their roles included harvesting edible goods, cotton, dragging and lifting up to 300 pounds, attending to children and livestock simultaneously, planting crops and operating machinery. In addition, the farm workers and, the families and their families were often on the move following seasonal crops, making migration central to their profession. When women began to enter their life stages, they quickly became mothers and continued to labor while pregnant. The life of the Contadina and Campesinas was surrounded by tragedy as families often experienced infant mortality or the death of a child. Examples of the hardships and, labors and labor conditions of these women exemplify the need to treat testimonies as text and to be, able to, to be able to apprehend the lifestyle of these unimagined communities. In Nuto de Rebelis, L'Anello Forte, published in 1985, a is a collection of 260 transcribed oral narratives of women from Italy's Italian Pianura or the Po Valley, the region rich of agricultural production. The contadine that Rebelli is interested in are farm workers, old, young, widowed, married, and those who migrated from Southern Italy to Northern Italy. In his introduction, Rebelli initiates with contextualizing the testimonies with their historical context. The industrialization of agriculture impacted the pianura as many big growers were beginning to buy up big land plots for mass agricultural production. This made it increasingly difficult for contadini to stay in their own family farms. Italy's miracolo economico is characterized by people moving into urban city centers from rural towns, taking up jobs as factory workers or agricultural workers, resulting in internal migration. One of this example is Teresa Garro, campesina from Peverano. She recounts as her sisters from age eight migrated weekly into Cuneo to work in a textile factory. Quote, a otto anni, le mie sorelle son, sono andate tutte alla filatura. Andavano a Cuneo a fare le filose, il primo lavoro che potevano fare. Partivano la domenica sera in gruppo con le altre e tornavano poi a casa il sabato notte. Andavano a piedi da Perveragno a Cuneo. Anche d'inverno attraversavano le neve. Unquote. Teresa's testimony is an intersectional example of how girls raised in farm working spaces mature quicker, but also how migration is interlaced in economic opportunities. Eventually, the textile jobs were replaced by machinery. To get an idea of the type of farm work that women did, Maria Airaldi in Barberis, a contadina from Roca de Baldi, opens up about her role of a contadina, stating, quote, La donna di campagna diventava vecchia in festa. Tra la vita, fama e tutto il resto. Una volta per maggior parte delle donne, le bestie erano al loro carico. Le bestie le guardavamo noi e tu i cominciavi a mungere. Non era poco. Mettiti di sotto d'estate un caldo da crepare. Bisognava farlo. Gli uomini avandavano in campagna e le bestie restavano a casa a tuo conto e tu ti arrangiavi. Maria stresses the toll that farm work has on a woman's body, emphasizing the way that women mature and age faster in this work. In addition, she clearly describes the difficulty of milking a cow, especially in the hot summer, this being one of her daily duties. Maria's testimony echoes the contadina tasked with attending to their own family farms. Teresa and Maria, Ma Maria's testimony, speak to the way that women rapidly mature within these jobs, but also the way that women's bodies are moving and contributing to the industrialized Italian workforce. The agricultural industry in the United States Southwest looked a little different than Italy's model, but it is primarily driven by the same capitalistic and neoliberal structure. By the time the US started its Bracero program, the US agricultural industrialization had begun to take over small landowner farms. The Bracero program began in 1942 as the US joined, as the, US joined the Allies in World War II and officially ended in 1963. The University of California San Diego Library has archived oral narratives from farm workers who participated in the United Farm Workers Movement Documentation Project. In these archives, campesinas like Esther, Esther Uraday testified to working conditions of her and her family in agricultural fields in the U.S. Southwest. Esther recounts picking plums at age five with her pregnant mother in one of the plum orchards in Morgan Hill, California, describing, quote, picking the plums. And from later on, my mother used to go, well, she used to go and she used to get a big, or she used to be pregnant almost every year. So every time that we went, she was pregnant and she used to get a big, there's a big stick, sort of that has a hook on the end of it. And she grabs 
a hold of one of the biggest branches on the trees, unquote. Esther's vivid testimony speaks to her mother's double labor while working, while working pregnant and fulfilling her role as a campesina, and her body reaches and pulls the plum tree's branch down while Esther collects the plums. Esther, at a young age, campesina herself, also participates in this agricultural production, demonstrating her early entrance into that workforce. Esther's testimony echoes the testimony of the contadina, where young women, well, where young girls entered work due to socioeconomic conditions, but it also stresses the roles that these young farm workers took on in early stages in life. The testimonials of the contadina and campesinas uncover in unimagined communities that have sustained our communities. To this day, their labor and contributions are occulted behind the obstruction of neoliberal industrialization. By opening up to the voices of the contadina and campesinas, we're able to apprehend how women's hidden labor, migration, and socioeconomics form and shape the lives of the agrarian workforce. In the testimonies of this research, I have also encountered the ways that the contadina and campesinas have prided themselves in their right to participate in a democracy. This further helps them empower themselves to be able to seek better opportunities for themselves and their families. In Italy, many of the contadini who left agricultural did, agriculture did so for good and out of necessity, working in industrialized jobs. The US still utilizes many campesinos within their, within the its agricultural and indi ag uh, industrialized agricultural production and therefore we must be attentive and aware to the way that these unimagined communities begin to represent themselves and apprehend the ways that they too break out of their unimagined status at this time i would like to thank the university of oregon food studies program for the opportunity to speak in today's talk thank you so much and here are my sources Another terrific presentation. Thank you very much and look forward to a uh, conversation about that too. Grazie. And uh, last but not least, Ellen, we'll turn the, turn the screen over to you. And then after Ellen, we'll have questions and comments from, from the audience. Uh, thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Ellen Ziesenhen. I'm a Global Studies um, MA candidate and I want to thank the U of O Food Studies Department for their generous research grant that allowed me to find the visibility of culture and food security literature of West Africa and conduct this synthetic review. So I came to my master's program seeking to engage with West African food security. And my original plan was to conduct field, re field research that was inspired by my Peace Corps service um, in Guinea, which is in West Africa. I lived in a Kisi community and was often told during meals that I wasn't fully eating unless I had rice in my meal. And so that really allowed me to become more curious about the cultural well being and the intersection of culture within eating food nutrition and food security. So that was my original plan was to return to that village um, and better understand how Kisi people perceive food security and experience it and what foods were important for their food security um, in that specific village. However, the pandemic happened. So we had to look at some plan Bs, Steven and I, he's my advisor. And it was really clear that remote field work really was not gonna be an option due to infrastructure issues in Guinea, specifically in that region of Guinea, there is not a lot of internet, so could not really do remote field work. So I was inspired by the work of Dr. Joe Weaver, who is a professor in the Global Studies Department and is also serving on my committee. She has conducted a synthetic review before looking at the intersection of mental health and food insecurity in developing countries. And I really thought it could be a great option to better understand the more comprehensive experience and current literature around food security in West Africa. So I think it's really important first that we just know what food security is, which probably all of us do because we like food. Um, so I am basing my definition on the UNFAO's definition of food security, which states that food security exists when all people at all times have physical and economic access to sufficient, safe and nutritious food that meets their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. This is kind of the baseline definition that many development practitioners and re academic researchers use when they're looking at food security. And this is 
usually made up or supported by these four pillars that include availability, access, utilization, and stability. And these four measure or these four pillars are often measured with quant uh, quantitative measurements um, that oftentimes do not produce a holistic understanding of the full food insecurity or food security experience. And oftentimes culture is not included in this measurement. And so I'm seeking to see where the gaps are in food security measurements of West Africa and where culture is or isn't included. And this curiosity is uh, supported by the works of Cedro et al. 2015 and Power et al. or excuse me, Power 2008. And these two authors um, conceptualize this idea of cultural food security. And it's kind of the intersection of nutritional well being and cultural well being and where they meet. So, culture, like food security, is a very uh, shifting and moving idea that has so many definitions and, 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 and concepts and applications. And I've gone through tons of definitions of culture from the early like ninth or 20th century to now and have kind of pulled key ideas that are reoccurring. And this quote really presents those three key ideas. Um, so culture confronts the different questions of what is valued in terms of well-being, who does the valuing, and why economic and social factors interact with culture to unequally allocate access to a good life. So I kind of pull this these three ideas of what, who, and why, and through my previous research of other definitions of culture, I have come up with these three thematic applications of culture, which are livelihood and practice, that includes the what, who, and why. Then you have social, which includes the who and why, and then systems of meaning, the what and the why. Um, and so in the articles I've looked at, I'm applying these three themes, or I'm looking for these three major themes of culture. So I utilize the PRISMA methodology for this um, research, which is kind of like a guideline of how to conduct a comprehensive synthetic review. And um, in my literature search, I engaged with two sets of keywords that were um, developed through preliminary research I did before conducting this review. I have one set that engages with concepts around food, which includes food security, food insecurity, food availability, food shortage, hunger, and food waste. And then I have a second set of keywords that are more qualitative experiences um, or where food is often incorporated in academic research. So there's development, well-being, culture, happiness, community, and tradition. And so within my research, a word from key from or a word from keyword one group, was paired with a word from keyword two group, um, and they were all eventually paired up together in every single um, search. So I used three databases, GeoBase, Africa Bib, and Social Science Premium. And it was really interesting that Africa Bib only produced one um, relevant article, and it was mainly due to geographic location. Most articles coming out of Africa Bib are produced uh, or were conducted in. East Africa or Southern Africa. Um, and that was also due to my inclusion at criteria of being produced in English as well, I think. So I have a set of inclusion and exclusion criteria that I applied to every single article. It had to be based in the geographic region of West Africa, which consists of 16 countries. It had to have been produced in English. It must have been published between 2005 and 2020 in order to just maintain a manageable set of articles. Also, in these in this time frame, there were pretty significant global experiences within food security or food insecurity and the global economy as well that could have affected um, research priorities, development priorities, and just general experiences in a local area. The articles had to have been peer, peer reviewed. They needed to be based on primary source methods. Um, they could be supported by secondary source methods, but it could not be the foundation of the article. So that excludes all um, like policy 
briefs that were conducted that were included in these searches. There also needed to be a strong conceptual engagement of food security, either in the background or the like key ideas, concepts, or sections of the article, or in the thematic application within the discussion or the analysis sections of each article. There also had to be engagement around at least one of the three applications of culture um, in order for an article to be part of the included uh, deeply analyzed articles. <laughs> so then, oh, we're gonna go back to that slide I had before and now you see kind of some more branches coming out of this culture idea. So once I got my included articles, I went through and I coded each ones that engage with livelihood and practice, which had the most articles engaging with that concept. Then social was next um, with, so livelihood and practice had about 60 articles engaging with it. Social had about 40, I believe. And then systems of meaning only had about 20 articles engaging with it from my included articles for deep thematic engagement. Um, so then I have some branching sub themes coming out that are gonna be included in my final product. So in livelihood and practice, the key themes coming out of it are income generating activities in relation to food security and culture, the urban rural nexus that people engage with, and then the resilience building and coping mechanisms, especially in relation to climate change and its effects of cultural well-being and food security. In regards to social, you have gender experiences or implications, network building and community building, and then age, which was actually kind of a surprising uh, theme that I found. And then with systems of meaning, it's how authors applied or engaged with perception. So now I'm still in the process of writing and I plan to defend my thesis in August. I started off with 304 articles that were pulled from my initial search. 110 of them were duplications, so they were removed or those duplications were removed, leaving me with 194 articles to um, do further analysis on. I have 77 that have deep engagement with food security and those applications of culture. And with those, I am currently going through and rereading and recoding and finding which ones will be the um, included. And I'm choosing 30 to have like a manageable, not super like long thesis. Cause if I include all 77, it'll just be like way too much. So that's where I'm at right now. And I want to thank Professor Wooten, especially for, you know, helping me decide on my plan B option and the following research grant opportunities that I received and especially the food studies department. Thank you. Let's see. Bravo. I was awesome. Ending my screen sharing. There you go. There we uh, go. Really terrific. The three, three together, just, you know, we didn't have this, plan, but the three together offer a really nice kind of vision of what I think food studies can do and be. So I'm really glad that they kind of appeared in concert here today and, and uh, you know, from methods to topics and approaches from strong humanism and, and text analysis of various kinds to kind of more quantitative analyses, thinking about roles of culture, you got social science stuff, all kinds of things. So terrific. You know, that's really, you make, you make the case for an interdisciplinary field of food studies very easily. So I appreciate that. Let's, uh, let's see if we have questions from audience members and, and our comments or whatnot. We can have a little conversation. It's 1242 now. So we have about, you know, uh, just under 20 minutes to chat and ask people questions and, and feel free to ask each other questions too, if you want panelists. And uh, Lisa and I can watch for hands or you can jump in. We don't have a huge group, so we'll probably be okay just jumping in. I have a question for Anna. Um, there you go. I think it's a great study you did and it's like super necessary. So thank you for doing that. And I got really excited by your like dream project for the future, the longitudinal study. And I think it would be even cooler if you could even talk to people before they've entered university and understand that experience and just even like make it, I mean, way more difficult for you, but 
it would just be so cool to just like see how that progresses from like family life to living alone college and then onward I completely agree completely agree I just always I think about like the logistics of like why hasn't a study been been done like this before and I'm like oh because it's really difficult to do such a longitudinal thing um so it's like a dream and I I totally agree like having them before um like when they're that emerging adult like that transition period from from being under care of parent guardian to going to college to being alone because we know that that transition too is a big one right um so I completely agree with you <laughs> Mm-hmm. It's just like such a glimmer of like, this is a neat thing to think about, but it'll be in the future, hopefully. But yeah. Absolutely. And and like that idea that that's come up in both Alan and Anna's thing about security, food and security. What does it mean? You know, what does it mean? You get your definitions and you use those as best you can. Right. But they may not uh, indicate something that you're really trying to understand very well. So I think that's also a nice kind of a bookend, you know, the insecurity, security thing. What does it mean? And then just a comment about, you know, Alan, your question or suggestion is a good one, too, because ultimately it'd be really interesting to know about, you know, backgrounds of insecurity and the background insecurity kind of carry through and carry into college and out of college. You know, is it a, a, a like you said, chronic, you know, anyway, good, good, good comment. Other other comments or questions for folks? Mary, you want to go ahead with your question? Okay. It's also for Anne. I, I'm curious. Did you did you find out what the students are eating? Uh, uh-huh. Uh, and we looking at a diet high in processed foods, high in. Yeah, so there were that's, eight that's class- question. Yeah, so there were eight. There were eight items that were um, assessed when it came to eating behaviors. It was fruit intake, vegetable intake, whole yeah. grains, protein foods, water, <laughs> um, sugar sweetened beverages, uh, energy drinks, and then fast food or food from like a counter from a restaurant. So that was all that was assessed. And that was something that was actually brought up in my, um, my dissertation defense meeting was, um, you know, we, we went through such a long vetting process with these questions. It would have been nice to see um, a little bit more with like processed foods, which was not assessed. Um, So as you saw, there were no, there were no significant changes for those, all of those categories, including like fast food or restaurant meals and sugar sweetened beverages and energy drinks, which were assessed. Um, So there wasn't, there wasn't a, there wasn't a statistically significant change from before the pandemic to during the pandemic for those Mm -hmm. categories. But yeah, um, I, this was like the best way to get this data for like such a big group, right? Um, so I think in the future, maybe asking a little bit more in depth about like, you know, typical college eating behaviors um, would be appropriate. So that's for future directions. <laughs> more research needs to be done. Yeah, Thank exactly. Thanks. Thank you, Mary. Diana, do you have your hand up there? Yes. So uh, first, a huge thank you to all three presenters. This was really wonderful to listen to and to um, hear some of the intersections that come to the fore here. Um, I have a question for uh, Yasmin. Um, and that is, uh, you did a wonderful job with um, looking at digital and uh, text collect- uh, and text archives, uh, given the constraints of COVID. Um, left to your own devices and with total freedom, where else would you like to go to study some of these testimonies and sources? There is so much that are coming out of these testimonies that I've been reading that I couldn't cover in this presentation. One of the things that I really wish would have co- I could have covered is um, food, um, how these women are sustaining themselves in this practice of agricultural um, production, right? 
with Revelli's texts because we're offered where he's talking directly to contadine they're actually just openly talking about all the food that they're eating so you're seeing a lot of polenta you're seeing a lot of fagioli which are beans fava beans and their recipes which is not something that we consider traditional italian anymore but that used to be the one thing that sustains communities in italy right um in the u.s southwest i found this one woman talking about how she would have cold meals in the middle of the day and how she was kind of repulsed by that but that's the only thing that was available for them to eat therefore like that's kind of how they sustain themselves so that's one of the things i would eventually like to look into um I would love to take a trip down to San Diego and visit that archive personally, as well as going into uh, the Pianura, the Italian Pianura, that Po Valley, and actually seeing for myself what those regions look like to kind of give myself a sense of uh, being in that in that work. And there's so much more to talk about in this um, with this presentation as well. There's also the idea of southernness that emerges within these two groups. Uh, like you are an other, you are seen as an other in a country that you know, quote unquote, is your own. So um, you see a lot of these things kind of um, bringing up, but at the end of the day, it's like, we have to start paying attention to these oral narratives or that information can be completely gone. It's great to have a novel that talks about industrialization and romanticizes it, but those oral narratives are the direct impact of what has happened over the years and through that violent takeover of industrialization. So it is nice to pay attention to those and analyze those as if they were being my first hand sources. Thank you, Diana. Other comments or questions? Alan, I have one for you while we wait for somebody else. Oh, there's two hands, go ahead. Good, I'm not gonna interject yet. Who do we have here? Sarah, do you wanna go ahead with your question? Good. Thank you. Sure. Hi. Uh, my question is for Anna. <laughs> um, and Anna, I was curious, and I'm sorry if I missed it. Um, did you analyze for race and ethnicity in your data and you didn't find anything of note there? No, but I did only do like a five coded uh, race ethnicity for my dissertation. And I need to redo it for to account for more, but I did like non-Hispanic, white, Hispanic, Latinx, black, African-American, Asian, Asian-American, and then other. Um, I was not instructed <laughs> or it probably was some, it was my bad. I did not account for, I have a multi, uh, multi-race, multi-race like category. Um, and I grouped those in with others, but it was not, yeah, it was not significant in my and Kova's that I ran. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was race with race and ethnicity were not um, significant from what I found, but I'm going to rerun them this summer because they, they might be. Yeah. Cause that would go against everything that we <laughs> like all other data that we find everywhere where race is extremely significant in food insecurity, right. In addition to LGBTQIA status. Right. So yeah. Um, that's interesting. Yeah. And student status didn't matter either, like undergraduate versus graduate. Um, and either did international student status. Huh. Wow. Yeah. yeah. The, the other thing I wanted to ask you was about, um, and we've talked about this before, I think with you and also with data on food insecurity in general, this notion of the biasness of people who respond, right? Like that, that more like people are more likely to respond if they're experiencing food insecurity. And so, you know, how do we sort of account for that? So I didn't, I didn't talk about this in here, but the, the vast majority of people who participated in the survey were white, female, heterosexual students. And we know that that demographic of students kind of under report, they report more healthy eating and less food insecurity. So the sample of people who took the survey is not a good representation of this, the UO student body, meaning food insecurity is probably much more of an issue is probably much higher than what was reported. That's my hypothesis is that it's not 46 or 47%, it's probably much higher because of the demographic of people who um, took the survey. So. Is there one more hand? I can't see the hands of, good. 
I'll ask Alan my question then, Alan. You know, one of the things about uh, the perception part of the culture stuff that you and I have talked about, you know, the things that did show up as kind of culture in the study and the things that didn't show up as culture in the study, I know you're still kind of uh, analyzing the material, but like what are some preliminary thoughts that you might have about like why an understanding of what security is and isn't is not in that dialogue, you know, in that literature. And I know this is part of the motivation for your study. So just kind of maybe riff on that a little bit. Like why, why isn't there much attention? And you can go to the Annis thing too. You know what I mean? Like it's the same, same kind of thing. Like what is insecurity? What isn't is insecurity? Yeah. I mean, I think I'm also going to be adding like a, a methods analysis section of my thesis that I didn't include in this um, mm -hmm. presentation, but I'm going to talk about what were the measurements used for food security and mm -hmm. does that have something to do with why perception or more uh, qualitative engagement isn't included. And that's mm -hmm. kind of what I'm finding is that many of the measurements used are based on numbers and, and mm -hmm. not perceptions or I, or like feelings. Um, so I think that's really why perceptions are not engaged with because mm -hmm. that doesn't have an economic, uh, like value really probably mm -hmm. in especially development practices or government programming, which is where a lot of these articles are being used for for support or being funded by um mm -hmm. so i think it has it comes down to uh money yeah. <laughs> perception yeah. don't give money like don't produce money uh -huh. and also it fits in well-being too like what is well-being what is secure insecure you know like we've talked about the if you were able to if you had been able to go back to guinea one of the things about your your work there showing that like if you don't have rice you don't have food you know what i mean so like the absence of rice in and of itself would be an indicator to to local people that they weren't eating you know what i mean they were eating something else or they weren't eating food that was preferred so I think that that's an important insight, whether it's for, you know, Anna's subject populations in, in U of O or in, in, you know, Kisi regions of, of Guinea and West Africa, that land of understanding what is food and how is food uh, relevant to people's lives, especially when you're going to measure it and say people don't have it or do have it. It's kind of shocking that there's so little attention from, from an anthropological perspective, right? Yeah. Other, other questions or comments from people? See some people having to kind of check out but other comments and questions that people might have. Great work. I see a lot of thank yous and great work in there, which is awesome. And I think uh, any, any, any thoughts before I kind of tidy up. And... Okay. I'm really glad that uh, that all three of you agreed to, to participate in this and show us the work that you've been the, the work that you the work that you've been doing and share that with us and uh, you know like I said at the outset to see the different kind of approaches epistemolo epistemological approaches you know methodological approaches subject matter and places really gratifying to know that people are working on such important things and doing it from such a wide range of angles and and seeing you know kind of a continuum from quantitative to qualitative work just in this subset subset of uh, of of scholarship that we're engaging and uh, folks that are going to be joining us later some of the students coming into the program in global studies welcome to this forum and you'll be in this spot sometime making a presentation to a new group of people uh, faculty members that have been participating in the food studies program thank you very much for being here students and uh, again thank you very much to lisa and and she lisa has put in the uh, chats how to connect with food studies you know our our food studies Facebook page is the most active spot where we announce things and share stuff. And uh, the list serve will make sure uh, send us a note or let us know you want to get on the list serve and do that and, and share news about the program. You're, you're great ambassadors for the program. So let people know like your incoming students, uh, cohorts or, or uh, whatnot, let them know about food studies too. 
So thank the three of you for your, your work and your presentations and good luck with the various uh, stages of completion that you're in. And uh, soon you will be finished with it. And bravo, like I said at the outset in our chat, for, for doing this work in a COVID environment too, which is not, uh, not an easy thing. It's not easy to do a graduate degree anyway. And it's much more difficult with these kinds of dynamics that have been impinging on, on people's lives. And I think it also gives us a little bit more empathy for people who struggle with various things and take that to heart and know that you know we face our struggles but there are some people struggling a lot harder in many cases than than us so thank you for doing the work you do and thank you for all for being part of the food studies community 